our problem. Go. Welcome. Thank you for coming. 152nd anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. Why is Gettysburg so important? Well, they made a movie out of it, so therefore that's important. Uh, Gettysburg was, in my opinion, important not from a strategic sense. Really wouldn't have made too much difference who had won or who had lost there. From a political sense, it was very important because that's where the politicians were back east. That's where the reporters were. That's where the foreign diplomats were. Vicksburg, which was fought during the same period of time, strategically was much more important. I would like to introduce a couple of people here. Norman. This couple of friends of mine, this is Jim Hebb, who is portraying a corporal of Confederate infantry. Uh, and this is Norman Hughes, who is depict, uh, portraying a sergeant of Union artillery. And as you notice, might have noticed coming in, he brought a toy cannon out front. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I want to thank both of them for coming here. Why don't you just introduce yourself a little bit, Jim? Well, first of all, I feel like a rose between two thorns. Nothing <laughs> 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 for when, when somebody is right, they're right. <laughs> um, I'm originally <laughs> I'm originally from Maryland. Um, I was born and raised in Sharpsburg, Maryland. My family later moved to uh, Brunswick, Maryland, which was called Berlin at the time. Um, I, I grew up knowing that my, fa my father's family, the Hebb family, four brothers fought in the Civil War. One fought for the Confederate cavalry, the other four for the, uh, the other three for the Union infantry. Um, the only one who wasn't captured or injured was the Confederate cavalryman. The, the three Union guys were all captured and later paroled. Um, it was a slave-holding family. I'm not very proud of that, but the fact is my family did own slaves but fought for the North. Fought for the North to end slavery. So it's kind of an ironic situation there. But um, my great-great-grandfather fought on Culp's Hill with the Potomac Home Brigade on July 2nd, 1863. Uh, received a slight head wound, so you can imagine what a slight head wound would have been with the, uh, the bullets and all there. But um, he was later paroled in, uh, not paroled, but he was later discharged in 1864 for rheumatoid arthritis, and it took my grandmother years and years to get pension, which was eight dollars a month. So that's me, I'm Jim Hebb. I'm from Maryland originally. I put, portrayed First Texas. Now you did have a couple of items in your front yard. Oh yeah. Our, our farm in, in Sharpsburg had a Confederate artillery position uh, there, and there were two cannons uh, in our front yard, well, up on the hill, to, you know, near our front yard. And I, up until I was eight years old, I believed they were my cannons. <laughs> and I would actually go up and clean the cannons and you know, clean up around them. And, take care of the area, and then Dad said, why don't you let the National Park Service do their job? <laughs> what do you mean, Dad? <laughs> They're not your cannons. <laughs> and it had broke my heart. I was about eight when I found that. Hello? I'm Norman Hughes. Uh, I'm originally from Colorado, or in this period it would have to be Colorado Territory. Um, so I'm sort of a Yankee by trade. I had one ancestor that fought in uh, a Missouri, I'm sorry, an Iowa outfit. My wife, however, her mother's from 
Hattiesburg, Mississippi. So I refer to ours as a mixed marriage. <laughs> <laughs> and I've always been intrigued with things that are too heavy to move handily and go boom. As uh, I think you probably all observed, I will be glad to go out afterwards and show you some details about it. But uh, oh, let's see. Uh, well, he was talking about the movie Gettysburg. Um, I portrayed both uh, Brigadier General Henry Hunt on the north side and uh, George Pickett's color bearer. So there's kind of a word for people that do that on both sides of something. But uh, <laughs> so that's a, a very brief bit about me. Uh, F, as Norman mentioned after the talk, he will be glad to explain to you the workings of the three-inch ordnance rifle which you brought. One of the reasons that I asked Norman to come here today is that you might remember that either early part of this year or uh, late last year, there was a posthumous Medal of Honor awarded to a man called Alonzo Cushing. Alonzo Cushing was a Union artilleryman who was killed during Pickett's charge, at the apex of Pickett's charge during the Battle of Gettysburg, and Norman will get into that a little bit. Back to the Battle of Gettysburg itself, well, I guess I should mention my uniform. I am a major of one of the thorns, <laughs> a, a, a major of Union infantry. You probably remember a couple of years ago I was a captain. Uh, the uniform shrunk, so <laughs> <laughs> this is all I could get in a hurry, so now I'm a major. Uh, Gettysburg itself. Oh, I was going to explain my uniform, excuse me. Uh, I am armed with a sword, and this particular sword was carried by <coughs> a captain in the 116th New York. He was not at Gettysburg. He, at that time, was out in uh, Louisiana, at Port Hudson, Louisiana, which was part of the Confederate uh, bastions on the Mississippi. And as soon as Vicksburg fell, then Port Hudson fell. Carrying a revolver, a Colt revolver, This one was also used by a Union soldier. He was a lieutenant in the 48th New York. Was not at Gettysburg, but fought at various places, including, if you ever watched the movie Glory, the Battle of Fort Wagner. I practiced that over a mattress. <laughs> <laughs> Some myth about Gettysburg. Why was it? Why did Lee go to Gettysburg? How many have heard the myth to get shoes? Oh yeah. Nah. Uh, first of all, there were no shoe factories in Gettysburg. There were no shoe warehouses in Gettysburg. And. Uh, Richard Yule's column of Confederate soldiers had gone through Gettysburg two days before, three days before. And I guarantee if there had been anything worth, I almost said stealing. Right? Procuring. Procuring. <laughs> uh, they would have got them. This whole myth of going to Gettysburg for shoes probably started in the 1880s when Confederate General Heth, or Heath, uh, wrote an article that said, we sent some scouts into Gettysburg to get supplies and shoes. Well, that, the shoe part took off, and, and virtually every history book, or at least the earlier history books, they will say, well, that's why they went there. No, they didn't. They went, they went to Gettysburg because it was a 
hub of five important roads. Once he captured Gettysburg, he would have had access to all that part of Pennsylvania. That's why they were at Gettysburg. Now, Jim, if you don't agree with me, feel free to correct, but be careful about that. We're fine so far. <laughs> We're fine so far. We, we are going to get into an area where we don't agree, but we will. The uh, next slide. Does anyone remind that you, Mr. Hibb, of the inadvisability of winning an argument with an officer? <laughs> no. <laughs> the, uh, when this whole thing started, there wasn't anybody in Gettysburg. We were it up here. The Union Army was down here, and the Confederate Army was down here. The Union Army at that time was commanded by a man named Joe Hooker, fighting Joe Hooker. Now, I don't know if anybody is aware of the nickname given to ladies of the night, Hookers. No. <laughs> <laughs> Hookers. Uh, uh, they got that nickname from hanging around the camps of General Fighting Joe. Okay. Not quite sure what he was fighting, but <laughs> anyway, we started here up the Shenandoah Valley. Booker, uncharacteristically, started moving also. He tended to be a slow plotter, but for whatever reason, he started moving also. There were several small battles going up this way, mostly between cavalry. Can you see it back there? Lee, moving going up here, gets up to this general area. He sends Ewell towards Harrisburg. Uh, some idea of capturing possibly the uh, capital of Pennsylvania. Uh, he got as far as the Susquehanna River. And then we find, much to his surprise, that Booker is sort of following his footsteps, but parallel. Why was he surprised? Well, because his cavalryman, a fellow named Jeb Stewart, was off on a raid. Now, another problem with this. Jeb Stewart had two titles, Chief of Cavalry, and commander of the Cavalry Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia. He was sent to screen, which he did very well, screen the movement of Lee's army in the mountains here to keep the, the Union Cavalry from going over the mountains and seeing what Lee was doing. He did that very well. Then he was detached and for whatever reason allowed the Union Army to get between him and the Confederate Army. At that point, of course, his value as a scout diminished because he could not report what he was seeing. He had left two brigades of cavalry with Lee. And commonly thought that Lee didn't have any cavalry. He did. But they were Stewart's two worst brigades, I would say. The commanders were not his best commanders. He took all the good commanders with him. It's an argument, and I tend to agree with it, that as chief of cavalry, he should not have left Lee. He should have stayed there and made sure the other two brigades of cavalry were doing what they were supposed to be doing and left the scouting mission in charge of one of the subordinates. He had some very good subordinates. Anyway, that's what he did. So for all intents and purposes, the Union Cav or the uh, Confederacy was without 
cavalry during the early stages of the Battle of Gettysburg. Again, they had the two brigades, but they didn't have anybody to tell them what to do, and, and so they did exactly that. Nothing. <laughs> Just have a little bit of water there. If General Hooker was moving his troops up, he got into an argument with General Halleck, who was general in chief, and a fellow named Abraham Lincoln about what to do with the troops at Rupert's Ferry. When he didn't get his way, he basically said, I don't get my way, I quit. And they said, okay. <laughs> well, what happened here was three days before the commencement of the Battle of Gettysburg, the Army of the Potomac had a brand new commander, a man named George Meade. Could we go ahead to the Union commander? Nicknamed the Old Snapping Turtle, which I think is probably appropriate. Meade took over four Hooker and didn't even know where his army was. Now, he had no reason to know what his arm, where his army was. He wasn't in command of the army. He was commanding the 5th Army Corps. He knew where they were. The, the thing that happened here, which I don't think would probably have been as easy a transition in the Confederate Army, there was a good staff for me to inherit. They knew where the army were, where the rest of the army was, and they were able to tell him. And he was able then to coordinate the, uh, the movement of the army. In the Confederate Army, Lee had a minuscule staff two men, wasn't it? Uh, a major and a lieutenant colonel. Not only just two men, but low-ranking men. He did have a chief of cavalry, but we've already discussed he was off riding. He had a chief of artillery who was basically ineffectual. Would you agree? I would, yes. Good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that was about it. So if Lee had, for whatever reason, become incapacitated three days before the battle, who knows what would have happened. Uh, the, uh, with the Union Army, but with a very good staff, Meade was able to take over and then proceed. And again, he wasn't really going towards Gettysburg at the time because he didn't know for sure where the Union Army was. There are three combat branches in, in the Army during the Civil War. The cavalry, as I mentioned, the infantry, and the artillery. At Gettysburg, the cavalry, with one very big exception, played a very minor role. The big exception was to go in with this man, General Buford. General Buford commanded a division of cavalry, although we only had two brigades in and around Gettysburg at the time. Without Buford, there probably would not have been a battle of Gettysburg. He, well, his task was to scout and keep an eye on the Confederate Army, which he did, and he got to Gettysburg. He recognized the ground around Gettysburg as being ideal for defense. He actually used his cavalry, mostly dismounted, basically as mounted infantry, using them to get to a position quickly and then dismounting and fighting on foot. Um, 
June the 30th, the Confederate villains go back to a map, if you would. Oops. Ah, that one's pretty good. The Confederates were approaching down the Cash Town, Cash Town Pike. Buford was here. The Confederates, who, as I mentioned, did not have cavalry, sent out an infantry scouting party. Who commanded that? No, I thought it was Pettigrew was actually. Okay, Pettigrew was. Doesn't make any difference anyway. No, uh, there was a uh, Confederate general. I thought, and, was, I thought it was Jewel. No, 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 Yule, Yule was up here. Okay. Uh, Confederate general with an infantry force was scouting Gettysburg. That would have been the job of cavalry. However, as we pointed out, he didn't have his cavalry with him. Buford, probably off the map, but had scouts all around here. When this infantry force started up the Cash Down Pike, they saw the cavalry, decided they weren't going to go to Gettysburg, and turned around, went back, and reported that there were Union regulars at Gettysburg. He was not believed. Oh no, it can't be. Got to be militia, just just local troops. Can't be regular. Well, they were, of course. So the next day, in the meantime, Buford again has scouts all around here. Lee has told Ewell, sent messages to Ewell, who was up here around Harrisburg to concentrate the army at Gettysburg. And he proceeds to do it with Longstreet's Corps and with A.P. Hill's Corps. Now that, that's a uh, something I should address. At the Battle of Gettysburg, the Confederate Army had three army corps. The Union Army had seven. It sounds like they were the Confederates were outnumbered two to one. That's misleading. Union Army Corps were smaller. They actually numbered when everybody got there, and not everybody got there until the end of the second day, around 93,000. The Confederates numbered around 72, 73,000. Uh, I looked up on the uh, Wikipedia, and I, I, I do know how to turn on a computer. <laughs> uh, and uh, they had the numbers down to like 93,431. Nobody knows exactly how many people were there because the records are rather incomplete. Anyway, at the time, at the beginning of the day of July 1st, the Union cavalry were the only troops at Gettysburg. Lee had given specific instructions to A.P. Hill, who commanded the Third Corps, which was the lead of the troops coming here, not to start a general battle until all his army was in place. The same orders were given to Ewell, who was up here. However, Ewell is now coming down here towards Gettysburg. A.P. Hill is already here. A.P. Hill sends General Henry, how do you pronounce it, Heather Heath? Heath. Heath. <coughs> you guys always pronounce things silly. <laughs> H-E-T-H is F to me. Anyway. We have an accent. 
he, he limited it to one syllable. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't hate it. <laughs> anyway, he sends Henry D. up the cash town pike with his whole division, I believe, uh, and runs into Buford's cavalry. Buford's cavalry, contrary to myth, was not armed with repeating rifles. They were armed with single shot breech loaders. No, that's okay. Such as this. Carving, short barrel carving. Limited range. They had several different kinds of carvings. Another one would have been this, the bird side carving. But they were deployed, dismounted. They fired on Henry Heath coming up, his troops coming up. Henry Heath did not know what he was facing. Again, he was still thinking maybe militia. But he had to deploy his troops. Now, in Civil War terms, that takes a lot of time. What Buford did, and it was a classic Dragoon movement, he's out here, fires, Henry Heath deploys, Buford falls back, Henry Heath goes back in the column, gets fired out again, deploys again. Buford keeps retreating, re retreating, excuse me, because Buford knows that this area is the area that he wants to defend. General Reynolds, who commanded the 1st Army Corps, is down here someplace. Buford sends him a message to come quick, which he does. So after about two hours of this skirmishing and whatnot, Buford is now about here on uh, McPherson Ridge. General Reynolds rides up. He confers with Buford and with the line between Buford and uh, Reynolds. We're going to have let's go surprise Harry. Yes. Uh, yeah, surprise yeah. Surprise Harry Heath. Yeah. Uh, good morning, John. What's happening? Well, the, the devil to pay. Henry Heath is coming up. Well, let's surprise Henry Heath. I don't think the words of that effect. Yeah. And they do. John Reynolds, who had been offered command of the Army of the Potomac, but declined because he felt that there was way too many politics involved, was arguably one of the best generals in the Union Army and commanded what is arguably the best division in the Union, uh, best corps in the Union Army. And his lead troops were a brigade called the Iron Brigade. And they deserved that title because they were very, very good. They wore, for the most part, hats like this. They deployed behind the cavalry. The cavalry then retreated. The Union, or I'm sorry, the Confederates advanced. And when they saw the <coughs> first corps, they are reportedly said, that ain't no militia. That's them damn black hat guys of the Army of the Potomac. And there the fight started in earnest. They had retreated by this time to Seminary Ridge, which is right about here, the Union had. And the fight really got pretty heavy. <coughs> Unfortunately, a bullet killed John Reynolds, almost immediately. The command of the First Corps then fell on a man named Abner Doubleday, who did not invent baseball. <laughs> uh, 
Let's go to the Union Journals again if we could. Next. This is John Reynolds, who, as pointed out, unfortunately was killed very early. Next one. General Howard arrives on the scene with the 11th Army Corps. General Howard, in my opinion, has gotten a pretty bum rap. He certainly had a problem at Chancellorsville where he was surprised. But when he gets to Gettysburg, where am I here? here is Cemetery Hill. Here is where the First Corps is. He deploys his troops to the right, basically where these blue stars are, to cover the right flank. But he leaves a division where that star is on Cemetery Hill. He recognizes the value of Cemetery Hill and Cemetery Ridge. and leaves that division there as a rallying point. He is forced to send a couple of the brigades of that division that, that he had up on the hill to support his other troops, but he still had a battery, I believe, and a brigade on Cemetery Hill. When the Union line starts to collapse, he has got his troops in place, so by the end of the first day, as the 1st Corps and the 11th Corps retreat, they have a place to retreat to. The first aid battle is always referred to as a, Union, as a Confederate victory, and indeed it was, because in Civil War terms, if you control the battlefield, you are the victor. But basically what happened was, they just pushed the Union Army back to where they wanted to be. <laughs> but look, that's basically what happened. Ewell had come down from the north. He had pushed the 11th Corps out of their position. Um, there is an argument here, and I, I know Jim's opinion. He's wrong, of course. But, uh, <laughs> That, can we go back to the maps? Oh, yeah, sure. The last map, I'm sorry. Sure. Towards the end of the first day, Ewell has gone down this way. A major battle has started, even though Lee didn't want it. But, you know, the results were very positive. Union has been pushed from here, way back to here. They, the Union line is not extended like it is yet, like it is there yet. There are now Union troops here and here. There's still just two Union Army Corps on the field. But the 12th Army Corps is arriving, and they're arriving around here. Lee has told you to attack that hill if practical. Now the argument is that if Stonewall Jackson had been there, he would have attacked. I know that's uh, Jim's idea, and he, he, he might have. But Stonewall Jackson wasn't there. Stonewall Jackson didn't kill at Chancellorsville. I believe the ghost of Stonewall Jackson was there because both A.P. Hill commanded the 3rd Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia, and Ewell, Richard Ewell, had both served under Jackson. One thing Jackson never did was give discretionary orders. Probably didn't affect A.P. Hill all that much, but Ewell really didn't know what to do with the discretionary order. When he was told to attack that position and practical, he then decided to talk with his 
ordinance to see if it was practical. One of its ordinance was Jubal Early. Jubal Early said, my troops are all worn out. They've been fighting all day. It's not practical. Some historians, pretty good historians, think there was probably only about a one hour window where they really could have successfully attacked this area. Anyway, after discussing it with the Yule, or with uh, Early, Yule decides it's not practical. So to me, that is the ghost of Stonewall Jackson. Would Jackson have attacked? I don't know if Jim thinks he would. Uh, he, he may have, but we will never know. But because of the way he ran his army, his two commanders, who had now were corps commanders, really didn't work well with discretionary orders. Do you agree? Well, my, my opinion, excuse me, my opinion is that uh, Stonewall Jackson, Stonewall Jackson would have never waited for an order. He would have taken that hill. And it would have been done, over with done. He'd had the artillery up there, and uh, point they moved. <laughs> <laughs> uh, could they have done that? Was there sufficient? Uh, give the distribution of forces there. What well, the Union forces on the field. Uh, uh, again, the historians, better historian than I am, say that there was about an, an hour window where they could have done it. But, and I think you will point this point, uh, Gettysburg is a maze. If you've ever been to the town of Gettysburg, unless you stay on the main five main roads, it, it's just a maze. When the Union 11th and 1st Corps retreated through the town, a lot of them were captured. The organization of the Confederate Army was all jumbled up because they were going down various streets trying to capture the Union soldiers, etc. It would have taken time to reorganize them in order to make the charge. Again, in that hour window could it have been done? I don't know. Uh, I don't entirely agree with Jim because uh, Stonewall Jackson had a mixed reputation. Uh, there were times when he went full bore. I did a little straight up the middle. There were other times when he procrastinated and did not move with clarity. Rich Jackson, when he showed up, well, may very well have been. The Jackson of Chancellorsville could have been the Jackson on the eight. Pardon? Or the Jackson of the seven days. Yeah, or the Jackson on the seven days. Jackson on the seven days was not real good. Jackson of Chancellorsville was excellent. So which one would have showed up? Who knows? It's a moot point. Of course, he wasn't there. So uh, the end of the first day puts Union troops here. The 12th Corps is filling in here. And that's where everybody thinks the end of the Union line is. Is that Culp's, Culp's Hill, Bob? Pardon? Is that Culp's Hill? Is it? Uh, Culp's Hill is here. Yeah. Cemetery Hill is here. This is sort of a valley here, saddle, I guess you'd call it. This is Cemetery Ridge going down here, and this is Little Round Top. But more Union troops come in during the night. The Third Corps, commanded by a man named Sickles, we go with the generals again quickly. There is a fairly recent book out called Lee's Last Invasion. It, 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 it's a pretty good book. 
However, what I liked most about it was the guy's description of various officers. He described Sickle accurately as a man spoiled as a child, matured into a scoundrel that oozed sleaze from every pore. <laughs> Other than that, pretty nice guy. Uh, wasn't, wasn't there also a book simply entitled Sickles the Incredible? Well, there's one called Sickles the Scoundrel, the American Scoundrel. But I guess what's incredible about Sickles, he was a politician and a lawyer. He also, his main claim to fame prior to the Civil War was that he had killed his wife's lover, who was the son of Francis Scott Key. Now, the fact that, yes, his wife did have a lover, but Sickles had about five of them. Uh, but anyway, he killed Francis Scott Key and used, uh, I'm told, the first time that the insanity plea was used to get him off, which he did get off. He raised a small addition. The way that I read it is it was the first successful use of the temporary insanity plea. And then knowing Sickles, the temporary may be more in question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And one, one more thing. I'm sorry. His lawyer was Edwin Stock. Yes. So who became the Secretary of War under Lane. The uh, interesting thing about Sickles, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but he makes what I consider a major blunder during the Battle of Gettysburg, which I'll discuss in a little bit, but has the great fortune of being wounded. Actually, he lost him. Had part of his leg amputated. Why was this fortunate? Because he got to Washington before anybody else got to Washington and was able to report on the battle. So he becomes the immediate hero of the Battle of Gettysburg. Of course, this is his own version. And by the time the battle was over, he's got the press and some politicians convinced that he won the Battle of Gettysburg. Actually, he almost lost it. But, uh, and I just found this out. In the 1880s, he even got the Congressional Medal of Honor, which shows what a great politician he was. <laughs> uh, oozing sleaze from every pore. <laughs> Chamberlain. We've all, we ever saw the movie Gettysburg. We all know about Chamberlain. Chamberlain did. He, he was on the far left flank of the Union Army, and he did order a bayonet charge, or at least somebody in this unit did, not quite sure who, uh, and held the extreme left of the Union Army on Little Round Top on the second day. Let's go to the, I think that's all of the Union. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go to the Confederate General real quick. Of course, we all know about General Lee. Uh, certainly a very, very good general. Longstreet, nicknamed Old Pete, also known as Lee's Old War Horse. He commanded the First Corps. Yule, whose nickname was, which I personally don't like, he was called Baldy Yule. <laughs> <laughs> Never understood that. Got me. 
next. A.P. Hill commanded the 3rd Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia. A.P. Hill, pretty good general, had served under Jackson. He was suffering from the effects, turned out to be a social disease. When he was under stress, he got quite ill. He was under a lot of stress at Gettysburg, and he was ill. I don't know how much that affected his handling of the, his core, but it certainly couldn't have helped. The same author that wrote the book that had the great description of Sickles describes Pickett as a congenial idiot. Uh, Pickett graduated the last in his class, I believe, at West Point. As did Custer. Well, I don't even talk about Custer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I agree. Uh, and I, I'll talk, I'll explain why I don't think much of Custer, but anyway. Uh, Pickett was a favorite of Longstreet. You know, one of Pickett's attributes was he was extremely loyal. And he did whatever you told him to do. And uh, Longstreet liked him for that. Next. Let's quickly go through the group. Oh, okay. Now, why don't I have Custer there? First of all, I think Custer was an idiot. But aside from that, uh, I read a book not too long ago that claimed that Custer won the Battle of Gettysburg, <laughs> which is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, Custer was not involved until the end of the third day. He was over here. <coughs> he did make a cavalry charge against uh, one of Stewart's brigades. But he probably didn't even need to make the cavalry charge. He, his troops were one of the few troops at Gettysburg that were armed with the Spencer repeating rifles. If he had just dismounted his troops and waited, there would, there would have been empty saddles all over the place. But he led a cavalry charge. He did not win the battle of Gettysburg. The Battle of Gettysburg was basically all over by the time that happened. So the morning of the second day, Lee, who was here, sends out a scout. I wish my fellows were standing here so I could make sure that he knew that an engineer did a lousy job. <laughs> uh, there's another engineer. Uh, he sent out a scout, a Captain Johnson, <coughs> but anyway, who was an engineer. And his mission was to scout the left of the Union Army. According to, I believe his name is John, he got up on Little Round Top, and there was nobody there, so he reported the lead that the Union line stopped about there. Nobody knows where he really went, because the Third Corps was still in this general area. Whether they were literally on top of Little Round Top, who knows. But if he did indeed get to Little Round Top, he certainly could have heard the Third Corps, probably smelled them, but there are a bunch of guys there, several thousand. He reports back to Lee that there's nobody out there, so Lee designs his attack to move Longstreet down here to attack up the Emmitsburg Pike to roll up the Union line. Obviously, that doesn't happen because more troops have moved in, and this is where Sickles makes his blunder, I think. He decides that he's got low ground here and high ground there, so he moves his line down here. 
like this. Leaving little round top open. When Mead finds out about it, and he went, he goes and joins Sickles to examine his new position. He, Sickles said, well, I had to move here because it's higher ground. <coughs> Mead points out there's higher ground in front of you until you go over the mountains. There's always going to be higher ground. Sickles says, well, I'll move back. It's too late. At that time, Longstreet troops start attacking. And one of the areas that they attack is a place called Devil's Den, where the first Texas is involved. It's okay. No, it's okay. First Texas. First Texas was ordered to attack up the Emmitsburg Road. Uh, General Hood saw this as a problem where they would be exposed most of the time. He wanted to go around Round Top and attack from the rear. <coughs> he was given the argument that it would take too long to get around there, to clear off the trees, to set up the artillery that the, the General Lee had ordered him to attack up Emmitsburg Road, and that's what he was going to do. Based, of course, on, on, Based, of course, on, on, on Johnson's yes. information. Absolutely. Uh, this is the only time in his career as a, a military man that General Hood launched a protest. And he says, I will do this because I'm ordered to, but I do it under protest. So, Hood is not, no longer brigade commander of the Texas Brigade. General Robertson is Texas Brigade commander. But Hood is now the division commander. He has General Benning, General Anderson. So as the 1st Texas moved out towards uh, what is now known as Devil's Den, the 3rd Arkansas was on the left, the 1st Texas was on, uh, would have been in the center, then you had the 4th Texas and the 5th Texas. As they proceeded across the field, the 4th and 5th Texas veered off towards uh, Little Round Top, while the 1st Texas and 3rd Arkansas went towards Devil's Den. Well, they crossed this Plum Run, and as they crossed Plum Run, they started up a hill. Union artillery was on that hill. And they were given the 1st Texas a full dose of what they had. There's a, tri a really strange little triangular field there, surrounded by a stone fence. The 1st Texas entered that, and with a charge, they went up and they took those Union guns. They were able to hold on to them for a while. The 3rd Arkansas came up on the left and was able to hold the woods to the left of them. At that point, Union had sent in reserves. They recaptured uh, the guns, sent the 1st Texas back down the hill. 1st Texas rallied, attacked that hill again, and retook the guns. They did take Devil's Den. But that's as far as they got. The 4th and 5th Texas attacked Round Top, and they were duly defeated at Round Top, along with the Alabamas, the Alabama and Georgia regiments. So the 1st Texas did accomplish their mission in capturing Devil's Den, but that's the extent of what they did at Gettysburg. General, General Hood, at that point, well, early in the battle, General Hood was, uh, had his right, uh, no, his left arm was damaged severely by artillery shell, and uh, he was out of the battle from then on. Until he rejoined the Confederate Army at Chickamauga, <coughs> where he lost his right leg. So they had to stra start strapping him into the saddle, because, but, you know, the guy was a fighter. 
He stayed, he stayed with them all the way to the end. I did a little straight up the middle. <laughs> straight up. Jim, Jim was, uh, was Rhodes been took over after Hill was done, or was he a, just a, a battalion commander? I believe um, Rhodes took over after you know, after the Battle of Gettysburg, but at that point it was still good. Thank you. The uh, end of the day, the second day of the battle, the Union line does look pretty much like this. Now with a couple of exceptions. The Third Corps has basically been just decimated. But the Fifth Corps has arrived. They have taken over Little Round Top and extended the line to hook up with the Second Corps. The, uh, the Sixth Corps, last Union Corps to arrive on the scene, is approaching. And during the night, they reinforced this area. Now, the big problem with what Sickles did was in order to stop the Confederate advance, Meade was forced to piecemeal troops in to fill up the holes. Now, that didn't have any immediate effect, but as I'll point out at the end of the second day, it made it almost impossible for him to do a real counterattack because he didn't have any cohesive troops available. They were spread all over the place. And if you visit Gettysburg and you look at the different monuments, you'll see elements of the 6th Corps here, the 5th Corps there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Not a co cohesive unit. Ewell has attacked the Culp's Hill area and been successful. This is on the second day again in the evening. Been quite successful because Meade had ordered part of the 12th Corps down here to reinforce that line. Ewell captures, actually, there are really two Culp's Hills. There's the North Hill and the South Hill with a saddle in between. He captures the Union entrenchments around here. And that's how the second day ends. The uh, morning of the third day, July the 3rd, Lee's original idea is to continue this attack. He is misled a little bit because Lee has been watching the battle from back here. Because he has seen a, on the second day, a Confederate brigade really get right up here. And he feels, well, we've really got them weakened. Well, that brigade, Wilcox's brigade, had been pushed back and the line reinforced during the night. He instructs originally, instructs Longstreet to continue the attack. Longstreet says, I can't do that. My core is just decimated. We don't have the strength. We cannot continue that attack. We then decide to, rather than continuing this movement, to charge up to Cemetery Hill. His figuring is the right flank has been weakened, the left flank has been weakened. The Union had to reinforce the left flank and the right flank, so that leaves the center weak. Well, it wasn't. Early in the morning of the third day, the 12th Corps troops returned to Culp's Hill, find the Confederates there, and start the battle all over again and eventually pushed the Confederates out. There had been, in Lee's plan, a cohesive movement of Longstreet, Corps, Pickett, 
charging up here, and you'll renewing his attack there. But as many attacks like that happened during the Civil War, it's really hard to coordinate because you know your cell phones were all dead. They didn't have batteries. <laughs> uh, there is quite this line is five miles, but the Union had interior lines of communications. The distance between here and here is significant. It's very hard to coordinate attack. Plus, the 12th Corps had started the ball and attacked Ewell early in the morning, pushed him out of there, so he was pretty much out of, out of business by that time. At approximately 1 o'clock, the Confederates start an artillery barrage. Let's go ahead to the video. They have massed, depending on who you read, 150 to 175 guns. All concentrating their fire. The idea was to have a Well, if they had those, there wouldn't have been any problem. One second. This is the beginning of what is called Pickett's Charge. More appropriately, it should be Long Street's advance since they were more involved in just Pickett's division. It was preceded, as I mentioned, by almost a two hour artillery barrage. Go ahead. Let's, Go ahead. Let's, okay. let's pause it for just a moment. Okay. A uh, two hour artillery barrage that was basically ineffective. And I'm going to ask Norman to just explain <coughs> what happened and why it was affected. Thank you. Well, as I said, I've been interested in artillery for quite some time. And I started out with a lot of misconceptions that I hear on a fairly regular basis because I was thinking of you know, cannonballs and flaming torches, fuses burning down. Uh, nuts and bolts and rocks and chains, uh, all of which I won't say never happened, but I've never read about them, so in effect, never. Artillery is a bit more complex than you might first think, and it can, uh, it can depend a lot on ground. We've talked about ground any number of times. If we take this as the width of the battlefield, we have about one mile across here. With the Confederates in the tree line here and commencing their bombardment. Well, how big is a man, the apparent height of a man at a mile? It's not a very big target. Also, there's a swale in the bottom here that the pipe goes through. And it doesn't look very major to us, but there is a rise here, of course, a fall off there. This permitted the artillery to do something uh, pretty obvious, really. You know, if, if I wanted to shoot at you, would I stand here? Or would I do this? Obviously. So that left the artillery batteries, instead of sitting up here in the obvious spot, get down a little bit so that they were not as exposed. Also, this slight swale, swale and hill is a classic problem. You're firing a mile away. You fire around. Well, first of all, there's this huge cloud of grayish smoke. So you may well not even be able to see where that round lands. 
But if you see where it lands, you're trying to judge depth perception in a mile. So you see one land. Okay, I must be short. You try another one. It lands. You probably will have trouble judging that one for sure. Then finally one goes over. You think, I've got them. That was the range. But it's such a flat trajectory with this again that the difference between hitting and going just over the hill. Let, let me point out something that yes. might be confusing. Their purpose, the Confederates' purpose, was to silence the Union batteries. And what Norman is showing here is the position of the Union batteries. The uh, Go ahead, I just want to make, make sure that that was, Right. Uh, the line was established there yeah. with... Uh, at this point, um, with the artillery barrage going, artillery is a, a major point. It isn't always, though I hate to admit that. But, uh, so, you wind up very often not doing a great deal of damage to your target here. Sometimes the uh, troops in reserve here just caught hell because their shells were coming in, but that wasn't a big problem. One of the problems is that um, it varies according to gun, but you typically go in with 200 rounds of ammunition. Sounds like quite a few until you know that the rate of ammunition of uh, firing is three rounds per minute. So 200 rounds only lasts you something like an hour. And that's if you're a scared crew can beat that uh, 20 seconds a little bit. So the answer is if you have a battery that's running low on ammunition, and keep in mind that there are four types of ammunition if you're running low on the type you need, you do not, do not resupply that battery in the field. You draw it off. You have an artillery reserve here. You bring it up with a new battery, then you can replenish that one. So it's a constantly rotating thing. <clears throat> From the perspective out here, what do you see? Damn, we've driven off this battery and that battery too. Is it time? Sounds like it may be about time for that. You very seldom have a perfect moment there. And so we wind up with what becomes known as the high water mark of the Better see. Uh, may I talk about Cushing or no, no, no. Let, let, let okay. wait just a minute. But that's a quick analysis of the artillery situation. Let, let me point out something else too. <coughs> Would you <coughs> to remember there are 150, 175 guns fired. It would be difficult to know which of those bursts was from your gun. Also, and correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the problems with artillery, especially on fairly soft ground, of course it will recoil every time it fires. The trail will dig in a little bit every time it fires. This elevating screw here, which controls the elevation of the barrel, every time it fires this barrel will bounce a little bit. That will make the elevating screw move just a tiny bit. With a trained crew, that's not a problem, if you can see your target. But because of this huge amount of smoke that is generated by all those guns, you can't see your target anymore. And you try to compensate, but you really don't know if you're doing it correctly. You just can't, basically can't see the target. So and when after the talk, and Norman will show you the cannon, and he can explain that a little bit better. Let's go ahead with the video first. Can I have a moment here? Sure. And now for counterpoint, these men knew their business by this time in the war, and they were aware of all these problems and were pretty good at adjusting uh, fire. One of the things that, they, that you learn is you don't fire the entire battery of six guns at once. Because what do you have? Uh, down there, six shells. You don't know. Fire them by piece. 
and whenever you try firing by piece, you never get boom, 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 boom. Those go boom, 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 boom. That little rhythm <coughs> lets you look down, and you can't see the target. You can see the shell bursts, and you know from that rhythm what your battery is uh, firing. So you're sort of interpolating. You have a uh, counters those disadvantages to some degree, depending upon how good the battery is. One of the interesting things about this, and I know both uh, Jim and Norman were at the making of the movie, there's a fellow that we both know that claims, if you look real carefully, you can see him shooting himself. Uh, because he portrayed both Confederate and Union. showing a Union battery, and as I mentioned earlier, one of the heroes of Gettysburg was a man named Alonzo Cushing, and if you would just say a few words about Alonzo. Sure. Alonzo Cushing was uh, a West Pointer. He had a pretty uh, good rise because he happened to be in the class of 1861. Of course, he graduated as a second lieutenant in the morning. He was a first lieutenant in the afternoon, and the next day was on his way to the uh, army in the field. He wound up eventually commanding Battery A of the 4th U.S. Artillery, but he was more than that. He was a, a top-notch battery commander, no question about that. Um, he met an unfortunate end, but more than just being a battery commander, he was a, a friends personally and professionally with E.B. Sumner liked him, and though he commanded his battery on the third day, July the third, he was on the field on the first day, and curiously enough, wound up in essence performing as uh, an artillery staff officer. He was apparently instrumental, rode up and down the lines as a consultant, and had quite a bit of authority to place the guns where he thought they uh, should be, or at least advising them. And when he was nominated by for his uh, medal, the one general at least thought his uh, congressional medal was really more for his actions on the first day in locating and laying everything out for success than on the third day where he was right at the angle, the so-called high water mark of the Confederacy, and uh, he personally got uh, hit by the wave of the high water mark of the Confederacy. He had one gun left out of his battery. He was personally manning part of it. He'd been wounded two times, including what, a gut shot, and, and, uh, which might more properly be called a disembowelment. And you know, it's it's a devoted man that will hold his intestines in place while he's firing a gun. You just got to admit that. And uh, he kept doing that until he got hit uh, in the head and killed. So I can't think of anybody who deserves a congressional medal more than Alonzo Cushing. Why did it take 150 years to to, to, to get it to him? Well, he wasn't the politician that Sickles was. <laughs> also, the criteria weren't really established. We think it's, uh, and it's even specified now, for gallantry above and beyond the call of duty. And uh, there's more wordy wording than that. So we're used to it being 
exceptional bravery, such as displayed by Professor <coughs> Cushing. But uh, at the time, uh, it, I think it was uh, about the only medal that was... It was the only medal. The only medal. So if you wanted to recognize somebody, you gave them a medal. And, uh, in one case, there was one regiment that every man in the regiment was giving him was given the Congressional Medal for re-enlisting. 27th Maine. <laughs> okay. yeah. 27th Maine. Uh, they, they were eventually rescinded, but they, it was basically who you knew, and uh, they were, to an extent, passed out like popcorn. Let's go ahead. fence they're climbing are the two fences along the Emmitsburg Pike, which probably had quite a bit to do with the slowing down of the impetus of the charge. That horse is very symbolic. The uh, generals were, all officers were told not to ride horseback in the charge, but a man named Garnett, who had been criticized, in fact, court martialed, although it, it never actually happened by Stonewall Jackson, again, the ghost of Stonewall Jackson. He uh, was arrested by Stonewall Jackson and had, uh, because all he had done was pull his troops back to keep, uh, this was at an earlier battle, Winchester, I believe, Kernstein. Kernstein, uh, to keep them from being surrounded and captured, but because Jackson had not ordered it, he felt that Garnett was a coward and arrested him and threatened him with a court martial. It never happened, mainly because Jackson died. But well, he, you neglected to mention the part of um, Ted Turner in the charge there. Did everybody notice Ted Turner? <laughs> He's not that old. Uh, yeah. he, he was in the yeah. filming of it, and when the uh, premiere was shown here in Denver, when the, he got shot, the the audience. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see Jane Fonda with him, but that's <laughs> anyway. <coughs> now, now I forgot what I was talking about. <laughs> uh, yes, the uh, Garnett insisted, Garnett was quite ill at the time, but because he felt that his courage had been, an honor had been impinged on by Stonewall Jackson. He insisted on leading his troops, but because of his illness, he couldn't walk. So he mounted his horse and led his troops. He was killed. And so that the symbolism of the horse coming back without a rider. The defeat of Pickett 
meant Long Street's court. Ended the battle for all intents and purposes. There was this cavalry skirmish, really, but much more than that, on the, what's called the East Cavalry Battlefield, where some people give Custer the credit for winning the battle, which of course is baloney. The probably worst thing that Meade did was send a telegram to Lincoln saying, we have driven, driven the enemy from our soil. Lincoln's reaction was, what do you mean, it's all our soil? Uh, Meade may be forgiven a little bit because he was a Pennsylvanian and therefore driving the Confederates from Pennsylvania might have been his idea of driving them from the soil. I happen to think that, remember, <coughs> Meade had only been in charge of the army for a total of six days by this time. But all he did at the end of the third day was go, Phew. I haven't been defeated. Maybe it's not as complete a victory as I would.